life and we are going out with a bang for this podcast year. Our guest today is Jennifer Pinkerton and she is the amazing mother, writer, business owner of Pinkerton Psychotherapy. And I have known you for years socially through so much of your giving back to the community, but I am just so connected to you now after reading your journey, and I'm so excited to share it today. Awesome. So um, diving right in, you um, went back to school, decided as a older, successful woman <laughs> to create and become someone you that you could do and help the world and enjoy your life and know that you've made a difference. And we meet with people on our podcast to talk about this, but like you meet every single category. Tell us how you got there. Well, it was an interesting journey. I think that my life experiences up until now or a few years from now really shaped me in a place mm -hmm. where I wanted to do something very different. Um, I've been writing for a very long time about everything, everything from, um, you know, relationships to parenting to uh, social musings, a lot of different things. And I functioned as a ghost writer or a freelance writer. I did corporate things or just about anything I could. I just love to write. And I really got to a place where I started fine tuning. And I recognized that when I talked about connection and authenticity and the human condition, I was most focused. I was most inspired. It was what I really liked to do. Uh, all so. those words are what everybody's searching for to feel that yes. purpose. Yes. And so at that time, I thought, you know, I want to go to grad school and I want to go back and study what I had begun to study when I was mm -hmm. much, much younger. And I want to go back and look into psychology and look into um, counseling. And when I kind of got into that, I thought maybe I'll just get these credentials and, and really write more and be okay. a better writer, be more well-rounded, be more knowledgeable. But then I realized once I was in it, there was nothing I love more than holding space for someone else, giving someone else that, that time, that safe environment in which to share and reveal and learn and grow and be their most authentic self and basically return to the person that we're all meant to be that sometimes we get a little lost with. So that was kind of an epiphany for me. And I decided, okay, this is it. I'm going to pivot a little bit. And I got my, um, my degree and, and now I have my own private practice and I do everything from, you know, coaching therapy. I've got a lot of therapists that work um, in my practice as well for me. So we can really handle a lot of different needs and a lot of different struggles and presenting problems. And I'm also still writing. And I love the marriage of all of that together because it, it really combines everything in a singular way of what matters to me most. There's so many things that you mentioned. Okay, so first giving people a space to share their stories and connect with them. I feel like that's what we've all realized during COVID mm -hmm. is the importance of that, that those moments, those times, and we really figured out who was in our tribe and who we <laughs> wanted there with us mm -hmm. through that journey. Isn't that an interesting realization when you get to that point too, to understand that? I think that the timing of what all has happened lately has also put a spotlight maybe on mental health, a spotlight on what matters, a spotlight on, on who we want to be and who we want to be with. And what does our life really look like when we can slow down and be still for a moment and not be distract, distracted by the chaos and by, you know, our focuses of our careers and everything else. We had a time to really think about who are we, who do we want to be? And I think that it was a, a really compelling time for a lot of people to look inward. And there's certainly a, you know, a focus now, I think, more on mental health than there ever was before and more on your own ideas, your own journey, your own sense of self. And reflection is such a big part of that. And through my journey of really diving into living authentically and being my best self and coming alive, I've come to the realization that it needs to be almost daily that we're kind of checking more more um, meaningful choices uh, as to it does it align with my overall vision and it's actually helped me make choices throughout my day mm -hmm. 
to be more focused on what the goals are and not so distracted by the noise. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think self-care is really important. A lot of people have no idea what that even means. And so to figure out what that means to you, to figure out how to enact these boundaries in your life, to be able to position your life in a way that's emotionally healthy, where you can pursue your dreams, you can, you know, do whatever it is that you wanted to achieve that's been holding you back for so long. And so many people I've talked to, they say that it's, it could be meditation or it could be workout or it could be, but in, in looking at, um, blue zones, people that live to be a hundred years old, mm -hmm. there's seven of the nine characteristics are related to purpose or connection. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of it. So tell us if, if you're meeting with someone and, um, Tell us kind of how that journey of discovering yourself or figuring these things out. Tell us how, like, some of those steps that you go through with people. Well, it's different for every person. So that's a yes. little challenging to give you kind of a yeah. blueprint for that. But I do believe that it all comes down to having the moment to stop in your life and look at inward. Have mm -hmm. some self-awareness about your own behaviors, about whether they are, you know, cognitive distortions you may have, whether you have positive influences in your own life. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the people that you're associating with? What message do you have about yourself? What are you putting out to the world? Are you being authentic? Are you being vulnerable? Are you really taking the risk to connect with people in a way that's meaningful? I think all those things are, are maybe a blanket answer for what we look at when you're working with somebody, but each person has their own specific journey. They may have had trauma that has taken them to a different place. They may have attachment styles that they really didn't understand why they didn't function well in relationships. They may have intimacy issues due to things that have nothing to do with their marriage. They may have problems, you know, in a partnership at work or anything like that because of communication styles. There's, there's so many different things that shift and grow and you don't really realize why that's taking you to that spot, why you are functioning in that way. And so a lot of times when you go and you're able to work with a therapist or work with a coach or work with in a place where you're going to give yourself that gift to sit still and I consider it a privilege when somebody shares that with me. Mm -hmm. It's that honor to be able to work with someone in such a very focused and very specialized way. I think that the opportunity for growth and what happens there is quite transformative. So Rob and I had a situation yesterday where we had um, a stucco problem in our house and it was supposed to be a three month redo on the house that mm -hmm. turned into six months. Fun. <laughs> and um, expenses not paid by insurance. So you add all the stresses to that. And um, we, uh, of course, are like in the final stages and there's lots of conflict. So something happened yesterday and they connected with me and I went into his office and I said, I'm so upset right now. Because what happened today reminded me of what happened five years ago when we had another remodeling uh, problem. Mm -hmm. And I have every bit of emotion uh, from then added on to what happened today. Mm -hmm. And that's how mad I am mm -hmm. at you right now. And then I could also realize that what he did wasn't deserving of mm -hmm. all that emotion. Mm -hmm. And I could have some responsibility mm -hmm. for where I was. But still, I was mad at it. <laughs> well, I mean, that tells me you've done a, quite a bit of emotional work here, though, because you had some self-awareness. You were able to recognize, okay, this is really a story in my head. This is a story in my head where I am projecting all these feelings of something else that happened, and now it's here, and it's all your fault. But you realize that's not it. And so many times, couples get trapped in that primary emotion thing where the fight is really not about the fight. It's about yes. something else, and it's about what yes. we've put in our head that maybe our partner has no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> uh oh, Grace Kelly. <laughs> no, that so, is so mm -hmm. true. There's so many times Rob's like, what is going on? And I also know it's because we have trips coming up and I feel anxious. So there's a lot of that self awareness. She's like, I'm going to come sit on the couch. I'll be safer over here. Um, but you were able to stop, didn't I? You were able to stop yourself and say, okay, wait a minute. Th this is really about all this. And I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. And you know, it, you had that, that recognition and that's, that's a really key part. And that's, that's congratulations on that. That's good. I don't know that Rob <laughs> would congratulate me on that. Well, he's he not here. Got, exactly. <laughs> okay. So speaking of spouses, um, uh, you are married to an incredible man. Yes, I am. And you share publicly. So I think it's okay for me to say sure. that he is sober and he, 
and you met when he was sober mm -hmm. and you've written a book about that journey together. Yes. Share yes, a bit about that. Yes, I have. I don't talk too much about it because it's his, it's his yes. journey. I did write it for him and it's kind of up to him when he gets to ready to that point where he's ready to say, okay, let's, let's do this. But it was such a, an amazing experience for me to, to write that because um, I was able to see inside of him, really learn about his experiences and, and get a complete different viewpoint of what I thought he had gone through. And it's really amazing. And it, it, I had not studied addiction really as a focus okay. for me ever. I had not even written about it, even as a freelance writer. And it was mm -hmm. never something that was really on my radar. But I learned so much about it and had such a newfound respect and understanding of, of what it is like to live that 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 sobriety, that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And and um, it's really quite amazing. So we actually started a foundation together as well, where we help those who are struggling with alcohol or substance abuse and try to be able to assist people in going to get the help they need. So that's been a, a really nice um, journey we've been able to do together as well. So yeah, I really have enjoyed having having his partnership with me in that to be able to kind of pursue both. And our marriage has a marriage of those things that that, yes. that I'm focused on and that really matters to him. So it's really special. And I love that you're taking his pain for a purpose because a lot of people um, that I talk to, um, and I know for me in my life, I use my pain to define myself mm -hmm. and that became my story. Mm -hmm. I told myself mm -hmm. was the pain that I've been through as opposed to seeing my way out of it. I lived in it and with it. Well, and it was comfortable for you. It is. And isn't mm -hmm. that weird that pain mm -hmm. is comfortable for, for sure. people? We have familiar wounds and unless we learn what they are, then we'll just keep repeating them over and over again. That's part of the healing process. It really is. That's 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 that awareness that you're searching for. That's what you want to find is to look at your perspectives and the inside of your life to understand what have I gone through that's putting me in this spot? Where, where am I now? Okay. And then once you're able to get it, it's the why, the power of the why. And then you can look at things differently, make different choices, have different ways to function in your relationships, have a different level of connection with people. So it's it's really important. And you said um, you want to help people become who they were meant to be. Yes. There's um, a Bible verse, and I'm not, I'm Catholic, so I'm not good at memorizing them. But there's something about somewhere that God has given you everything that you need. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you just need to find a way to make it flourish. And I'm not saying right. it in the biblical <laughs> way. But that really, I was like, wow, I do. I have everything I need. That kind of yes. surprised me when I really absorbed that. I think we are born perfect. If you think about that, we're born exactly who we're meant to be. Uh -huh. But somewhere along the way, whether it's a traumatic life experience with our primary caregivers, whether it's mm -hmm. different things that's happened to you in life, different things that you had no control over. And we develop these coping skills, these maladaptive mm -hmm. coping skills sometimes that mm -hmm. served us so amazingly perfect during a time when we needed that. Yes. But then later on in life, they actually become a hindrance. They're maladaptive for that reason. They hold us back. And that's part of that journey to recognize, okay, I did this before, but it's not serving me now. You know, I was protecting myself. I had this great yes. ability to learn how to protect myself and through something through that was it. hard. Yes. Right. And to survive that experience. But now as an adult, it doesn't work for me anymore. And that's a lot of inner child work. That's a lot of looking back to understand, you know, in your family of origin and, and you know, what really was, was difficult for you. So there's a lot of that. I, I think that, an important concept is that there usually is within within every mess there's some sort of message and i think that that I that matters that to look for that the message in the mess mm -hmm. so i um alluded to it earlier but um in my family life growing up with a dad named vito cangelosi <laughs> he had very italian conservative traditional expectations and then he had this fiery girl with red hair when I was young, <laughs> with these passions that wanted to run mm -hmm. his business, and I should have been home having kids. And I, during COVID, I watched this incredible show called My Brilliant Friend, and it talked about people in the 50s in Italy. It was a show about them, even with Italian subtitles, and it showed how innately different their life was. I mean, young girls didn't even, weren't even guaranteed to get an education past middle school. And they all went to work for the family, but their goal was to get married. And I sort of forgave him 
for because that's what he knew and i i just regretted feeling pain over the way he treated me and be and being so angry over it when that was just all he knew and he was doing the best he could that's exactly it is that most of the time people are doing the best that they can they're doing the best that they can with what they have available to with them. the pain they went that's through. right so sometimes generational trauma can just be passed down and that maybe yes. looks like expectations maybe yes. that looks like this is the way things are meant to be done without the realization that there's room for growth here and it's really no one's fault it's just simply what they've been taught and what they've been modeled and yes. if you can stop that cycle by doing your own work, digging deep in your own self to understand what messages were I given? What messages did I have to show me, this is what I need to do, this is how I should behave, this is how I should react. You know, maybe you grew up in a way in which you weren't allowed to feel. Maybe it was, you know, we don't have time for that. We don't recognize feelings. We don't want to share those feelings. Possibly because those caregivers were just really uncomfortable with them. Not that they didn't love you immensely and yes. want to give you all the comfort in the world, but they, yes. didn't, they not know how. And so then you go on and you perpetuate that. And then you become someone who's really uncomfortable showing emotion. So then you have a lack of ability to connect with someone in a relationship. And those attachment styles are shaped at a very, very young age. And so you do that work and you can understand who you are, how you got to that place. And you're able to make that change. You're able to look at life really differently and function with your connection with everyone in a very different way. And I think there's so many triggers. I mm -hmm. think that for us to understand that it's not only about our triggers, but it's mm -hmm. about the triggers of our loved ones. Mm -hmm. That when I do something that makes Rob feel something from his childhood, right. that I have to realize that I can't get in there and use my Italian fight it out. And he's using his retreat <laughs> right. and I'm chasing That's after right. him, yelling yes, at him. Yes, it's never, it's never good. And he's like, you know? I don't want to hear it. I'm like, you're going to hear it. And he's avoidant and, and he wants to shut down. And then you have this cycle and this fight that can turn into something pretty ugly when that's not at all what it is. It's not it's at all. It's not. simply about what you know and what he knows. In the face of conflict, we've developed those coping skills that I referenced yes. earlier. And they are they are strong. They are ingrained. But they can change. Just so even people knowledge. our age. Absolutely. Can change. Absolutely. Do you hear that, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, Rob. Uh, yes. He needs um, to come out here and be part of this podcast. <laughs> absolutely. And it can be something that's so simple. It's like a light bulb that goes off from an epiphany standpoint that people just yes. don't realize sometimes what we do. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. We all have and ways even that though, we cope. Yeah. And even though we've done the research and we know sure. the steps. You still, and but um, I don't know if you're a Brene Brown fan, but her oh, Atlas of the of Heart, mm -hmm. and she's coming out, I, I think it's, there's 30 plus emotions she discusses, and she mm -hmm. talks about if you can name the emotion, then you can move from that place. And I read somewhere mm -hmm. that the same body experience you have for fear is the same as excitement. It's mm -hmm. perspiration, pulse increasing. Mm -hmm. And if you could change your mindset mm -hmm. and that used to make me mad. People, uh, when I went through meditation, they're like, no one's doing anything to you. You have a choice. And I'm like, I don't have a choice. People are doing this to me. <laughs> and I was like, people may be doing it to mm -hmm. you, but you don't have to absorb That's it right. in That's that right. way. So what are like some of the, do you have some well, tools with people? I think that you're talking about specifically learning how to respond instead of react. Oh, okay. And all that comes with the same topic. I'm, I'm going to drill home here, but it's that self-awareness. It's the ability to understand why do I do that? What is it inside of me? Am I a trigger with rejection? Is there a time when I feel a perceived rejection, even though it may not be real? It, do I have a trigger with feeling maybe I'm not good enough? So is there a perception of that? Yes. These are all things that once you can just do a little bit of that digging, you're able to really look at life very differently. When I say it's transformative, I, I really do believe that. So much of what we do and operate, we're just on autopilot. We're just yeah. doing what we what we know. And think about, you know, as an adult now, those lessons we learned when we were little, they're still there. They're all there. Some are amazing. Some aren't. <laughs> Okay, so how is it for your kids growing up with a mom who's <laughs> done all this research? Because Bella's no, like, I, I like hate Brene Brown. If you mention her name again, I'm going to... Ah. There's a little bit in our household, I must admit. Of, okay, okay. Mom, okay. Um, But that's fine. 
You know, I, I think that, that again, I, I could sit here and, and talk about what matters to me all day long, but if they're not in a place to receive that and they're not in a place to understand that, that's okay. They have to have their own journey. We all have to have our own journey. But I think that I've tried to focus on some messages that matter. I've tried to focus on, hey, you know, be who you are and that's okay. And why are you feeling that? Have you thought about why you're feeling that? Have you considered yes. this? What about this? And I think those are tools that if, you know, if they're able to take that in as becoming maybe their autopilot where they start thinking about things and they have a moment where they stop and they pause and they can sit with themselves and their feelings and thoughts. I think that that's one of the key things we can impart to our kiddos. But I did you know. a horrible <laughs> thing yesterday. I picked her up from school or two days ago and I said, how was your final? And she said, awful. And I said, that's okay. She goes, it's not Okay. <laughs> And I real, and then a later I said to her, you know what? I should not have told you it was okay when you were feeling it wasn't because mm-hmm. I really, validate those emotions. Yes, mm-hmm. and so much of raising a teenager now is about just enabling them to feel what they feel. Right. Mm-hmm. And I said this out loud, and I'm have a hard time doing it. <laughs> but I, we were talking. It was a family wedding. All sorts of emotion mm-hmm. comes out at a family yes, wedding. And we were talking to Rob's uh, stepsister, and I said, "I'm raising Bella to create her own opinions and mm-hmm. to help her have a roadmap for what she's." analyzing them against Mm -hmm. and I want to allow her to have an opinion different than mine how was that received well it it, from his sister-in-law not well because she had a strong opinion on the subject Mm -hmm. we were talking about Mm -hmm. and she was coming at us to convince us and Mm -hmm. I so I shared that with her for her to see that we all need a safe space again going back and another big part of this real connection research I've done is that, and you said this in the way you've described your practice, is that you meet with people without judgment and with mm-hmm. empathy. That's right. And I read that discernment is understanding your purpose and clearly knowing what your boundaries are. And judgment is coming from a place of authority over someone mm-hmm. and telling them what they should or shouldn't do. Maybe you can explain a little bit more about that because I feel in our political environment Mm -hmm. and so much of what we see in the news, the Mm -hmm. Twitter fights, Mm -hmm. that this is such a big issue where if someone's not like us, we can't like them anymore. There's a lot of um, struggles with all those things you're saying right now. And I think that the context in the world we live in today is so challenging. There is a fine line. You know, we want to be true to ourselves. We want to have belief systems. We want to have our own compass that determines this is what we feel is right. Uh This is what we feel is wrong. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. However, there's a fine line when you have to determine, am I also though projecting an expectation on someone else who has had their own journey, their own life experiences, their own compass, their own things. And they see something through a very different lens than I do. I may also look at the lens of everything I was taught growing up. I might look through the lens of all my life experiences. I might look through the lens of maybe some cognitive distortion, some, some, some thinking yes. that's a little distorted that may yes. be a little bit too black or white that maybe um, have to do with some, some issues I haven't resolved yet. And that's about us. It's not about the other person. So I think there's a lot of room for poor society, if I can say as a whole, to, to really do some work to understand that, you know, we can't, we can't change other people. We can only change ourselves. We can only look at how we react, how we respond. What's the difference between those two things and be able to sit in a place where we're proud of what we put out into the world and trying to change others, trying to, to make these decisions of, you know, it's black or white and I cannot, I cannot accept this. I can accept this. I don't know. I think that's a really difficult thing to do these days. And Mm -hmm. I think that, that, there's so much more room to have grace for people. There's so much more room to recognize that everybody has their own story and we don't really know what that may be. So if we can kind of stay in our own lane, sometimes I think that's a a little bit more um, giving and loving and authentic about, Hey, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. I'm going to respect who you are Mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yes. It's so, there's so much to learn there. There, um, And in regards to our boundaries, our 
safe places. I think it's also hard. We touched on this earlier. I want to go back to mm-hmm. it is our tribe, the people mm-hmm. in our life, That's who right. we, who were born with in our mm-hmm. life, who we choose to be friends with. And also as, as life evolves, who we become, mm-hmm. I think that's the hardest part of marriage mm-hmm. is that you marry someone where you are. Mm-hmm. And then as you grow, are you growing together together mm-hmm. in a supportive way? A therapist once told me that she thought the best marriages were autonomy mm-hmm. with a connection. It's really true. And um, so Let's talk a little bit about boundaries and what's safe and healthy and how mm-hmm. and how you might help people through some of those. Well, if I can say this on the podcast, boundaries are, are badass. If I can say that. But Girl, badass. <laughs> they are. Yes. Boundaries are badass. Badass. It's yes. really what I That's believe what that can yes. make the quickest difference and uh-huh. you feeling more in control of your life. You feeling like you can eliminate a lot of we toxicity. Like, she's like, what, mom? <laughs> um, I often try to work with people in some phrases that will work anywhere. So I'll give uh-huh. you some of those. Okay. Being good. able to tell someone I'm not comfortable with that. Oh, that is good. Being able to say, this doesn't work for me. Being able to say, I'm going to think about that and I'll get back to you. Being able to say no. Oftentimes, okay, those are scary. Cry. They're scary. That makes my have mm-hmm. I have tingles all over my body and tears. If you're a people pleaser, uh, if you yeah. you know know that that you're going to hurt someone, sometimes yeah. we're just highly empathic and we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Yeah. But if you're not being true to yourself, you're not doing anybody any favors because we all really need to strive to have real friendships, real people in our life that matter to us, and and not have a lot of falseness because the only person we're really hurting is, is us with that. You know, we need to be able to recognize this is what I need in my life. This is the the kind of environment I need. This is what is emotionally healthy for me. This is where I prosper. This is where I can, can excel and grow and feel alive. And sometimes you have to set boundaries that are really difficult. And people that don't accept boundaries that you set are people that are not able to do that. They don't set any themselves. Yes. So that's an important, I think, recognition as well. And with family, it's a little harder. It's very hard. Because there's a lot of love there and we have to recognize, you know, a lot of times people are, again, doing the best with what they have. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't believe that there's this knowledge that, you know, this person is doing something to this person because most people haven't done any work to figure out what they're doing. Most people haven't, haven't had any moment to stop Mm -hmm. and reflect and have any self-awareness. So I think that's a really key aspect of it. That lame comment. It's not you, it's me. (laughs) <laughs> it's true. It's very true. It's very true. It's very true. Mm-hmm. So um, tell us a little bit about your podcast that you're sure. launching. Absolutely. Um, I have been writing under this little trademarked moniker, Redhead Reveal, for many mm-hmm. years. And I decided that as I've continued writing and writing, and I've had a lot of um, conversations with people that I think that the podcast would be something be really fun to do and it'd be a way to get that message out in a different way. Mm-hmm. I also want to have a lot of thought leaders that um, share these same views, people that are within the industry and then I'm in, people that are researchers, people that are you know provocative thinkers. Uh, I'm interested and curious about all that. And part of what I do is really having this innate curiosity about everything. So I want to have that forum to be able to talk about that and to be able to share some of that and, and from a therapeutic perspective. So yes, I'm going to be doing that very soon. Well, I think it's so amazing that um, I shared with you the term icky guy, and we talk Mm -hmm. about that, is when you're able to discern what you love to do, what you can help people doing, Mm -hmm. what the world needs from you, Mm -hmm. and what you can get paid to do. Mm -hmm. And I think you've done an incredible job of understanding that, but people need to know you've done the work. Mm-hmm. And people need to commit to doing the work. Mm-hmm. Just showing up at therapy once a week is not That's right. And it, doing and it, the work. It doesn't have to be therapy. A lot of people go, oh, therapy. <laughs> you know, there's other ways. There's self-help mm-hmm. book. There, there, there's learning. There's having a sense of curiosity about everything. There's the idea of being more empathetic, having grace for people. These are all baby steps that you can start to take in your life to make subtle changes and shifts that allow more, more room, more space for you to grow. 
and to understand, you know, where you are and what are you doing and are you achieving your dreams? Are you, do you have something that's holding you back? Are you able to, to move forward instead of being stuck? And I think that's, that's really, that's really a big aspect of it. A lot of people don't, don't do that. They don't look around and go, why am I repeating the same things? Why do I have these patterns in my life over and over and over and over again? I just pick (laughs) bad people. It's like, okay, well, quit just saying that. And let's look at why. Why? What are you attracted to? Is there a familiar wound there? Are you attracted to someone that replicates something that you felt when you were younger? And that is your version of love. Is that the kind of love that you were taught? You think that's love. Maybe you think chaos is love because you grew up in a volatile environment. Mm -hmm. So you want to have a chaotic sense of love. Mm-hmm. which is hard. Oh, that's so hard. What if you're able to understand why you do that? And mm-hmm. what if you're able to heal some of that unresolved emotional trauma so that you don't look at love that way anymore? You mm-hmm. recognize love is actually supposed to be something that feels good. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly maybe you're not attracted to the same type of people anymore. Maybe yes. you look at someone very differently and people that you wouldn't have even understood why you weren't drawn to. Now you are because you feel at peace such a great part of the journey. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about adolescent challenges, um, depression, anxiety mm-hmm. with kids has increased to an all time high. Um, mm-hmm. So many friends uh, are struggling. We've talked with experts on social media. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the path of of teens today? Well, first of all, I'm so glad that, that I didn't grow up in the environment we have today because it's hard. You know, they are in an on, instant on, constant on, visible under the microscope every day of their lives. You know, with everything with social media, yes. everything is so exposed. They don't have a chance to, I think, be able to, to figure out who they are in private, figure out who they are and make those mistakes without everyone knowing about everything. Oh. And I think that's, that's, that makes an added pressure Mm-hmm. It's really a struggle. I think they also are exposed to things that I know that when I was growing up just didn't exist. And that exposure creates all these other challenges and dangers and things that make it really, really hard. Um, you know, I I think that the struggles that teens go through, especially teens, is probably more challenging than anyone could ever imagine. It, it's something that has become a focus for a lot of the therapists that are at my office who focus really only on mm-hmm that teamwork. I don't, um, mine is really more in the, my specialties are, or specializations are more in the relationship and connection. And I do a lot of personality disorder work as well. Um, that kind of ties in with relationship functioning sometimes. But, um, I think that the teen aspect of it is, is really one of the most important things that people come to see there before these days, for sure. Well, it's certainly been a it's certainly been a part of our journey, and um, we, as a family, um, have worked with a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. And there's, um, I think, meeting the right therapist mm-hmm. is it as important as anything. I almost yes. feel like it's as hard to meet the right therapist as it is to date someone. But you, why wouldn't you treat learning who your therapist should be as dating? You try it out. You figure it out. Do they have the same thoughts? Is what their message is something that resonates with you? I don't think it's something you just pick someone. I think you have to really connect, see if that works. And if not, you try something different because I'm not the right fit for everybody. And and neither is every other therapist. You, You have to find the right fit for what works for your client and that works for you and that you feel like you're in a best capacity in which to serve them. And for the people out there that said, oh, we grew up and we didn't have therapists and when we hurt, we had to work or we didn't, Mm -hmm. what do you say to that? Well, I'm sad that a lot of people don't recognize how important it is to be able to do some of that work. I'm I'm sad that people, there still is that stigma and it it still exists, unfortunately. I think there's been a lot of movement, a lot of progression, absolutely, but it is still there. And a lot of it is generational. A lot of it is cultural. And I think that until someone takes that risk to be so vulnerable to say, hey, I I need a little bit of help and to ask for that, I don't think that there's really a connection. There's not a cognitive understanding of that. And that's unfortunate, but, you know, it's kind of the way it is. I think that the more people that do that work, though, and the more as a whole we all look at ourselves and recognize I can be functioning in such a better way. And be able to do a little bit of that work and realize I, I actually am functioning in such a better way now, whether it is at work, in a relationship, with my family, with my children. 
I think that, you know, you may be just a little, a little bit in the dark out there. So I, that's one of the I things agree. I want to be an advocate for is to be yes. able to, to be someone that says, hey, this really works. This can be transformative. And that, that's just my, my passion as far as transformation goes. We all have that ability to do that. But yes, I mean, generationally, culturally, that, that sometimes those are big, big roadblocks. So there was even research uh, that states that having real connection in your life and being truly deeply connected to other people um, could be as valuable as not being overweight. Like there is mm -hmm. such a correlation to the length, and I'm not saying mm -hmm. it correctly, but to the length of your life, to the quality of your mm -hmm. lifestyle by how you're able to mm -hmm. connect with the community around you. Mm -hmm. So if you're focusing on working out and you're focusing on eating right and sleep being a big part of it, um, being at a place of peace in your life with the people in your life mm -hmm. and the people connected to you also helps you be healthier. Mm -hmm. I know when I would carry anger with me, I couldn't sleep at night. Mm -hmm. It made me restless. It affected mm -hmm. other relationships mm -hmm. and it changes your whole being. It does. And in there's um, a lot of research behind supporting too that our body keeps that, that trauma still within. So if we've experienced something that's been really hard for us and we haven't overcome it, we, we're holding that and it, it can project itself in a myriad of different ways. Our body is not designed to do that. And so we cope mm -hmm. and we store this uh -huh. and, and we have this emotional memory and we repeat it over and over again. And we, we, we really limit ourselves and everything that we can be doing. When you actually can have some peace, like you're saying, when you can feel free from a lot of things that hold you back, yes, absolutely, that's going to have some longevity you know, to your life. Why wouldn't it? Because overall, you're going to be a happier person. Overall, you're not going to be held back by things that, that are really um, difficult. And so. I think that the trauma aspect, so many people think of trauma as this, what we call big T trauma, where it has to be a, a you know, um, violent situation or and something very extreme. And there's little T trauma. There's other mm -hmm. things that, that affect you so profoundly, especially when you're young, that can change everything in your life. And you hold that and store that. And and you're not able to be that person, as I said, you're born to be, you know, I want, I want everyone to be able to return to that, to return to that, that, that place where you're whole, where you have that sense of peace, where you have that sense of grace, where you have that sense of love, and you can authentically and vulnerably connect with people and live a life that, that's really exciting and happy and joyful. There's so much hope in that. How Absolutely. do people find you? Um, our website is PinkertonPsychotherapy.com and same handle on Instagram, Facebook. Um, also, Redhead Revealed is is what I write under. So I have some separate additional um, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all that as well, too. So either one. Awesome. And when can we expect to hear your podcast? Hoping next month. So a few weeks from now, I believe. All right, great. Well, yes. we will stay tuned. Grace Kelly already loves you, apparently. Thank you for having me tonight. It was really Jennifer. nice. And thank you for having me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, keep living authentically and living your best life. Bye.